the skull said sadly. I warned you. In a terrible voice, a voice like hail on iron, it began at once to cry. Help! The king! Guards to me! Here are burglars, bandits, moss troopers, kidnappers, housebreakers, murderers, character assassins, plagiarists! King Haggard! King Haggard! Now, over their heads and all around them, feet came clattering and they heard the whistling voices of the aged men-at-arms calling as they ran. No torches flared, for no light could be struck in the castle unless the king himself ordered it, and Haggard was yet silent. The three thieves stood confounded and undone, gaping helplessly at the skull. "'I'm sorry,' it said. "'I'm just like that, treacherous. But I did try.' Then its vanished eyes suddenly saw the Lady Amalthea and they went wide and bright, although they could not have. Oh, no, it said softly. No, you don't. I'm disloyal, but I'm not that disloyal. Run, Schmendrick said, as he had said it long ago to the wild, sea-white legend that he had just set free. They fled across the great hall while the men-at-arms blundered loudly in the dark, and the skull shrieked, Unicorn! Unicorn! Haggard! Haggard! There she goes! Down to the Red Bull! Mind the clock, Haggard! Where are you? Unicorn! Unicorn! Then the king's voice, rustling savagely under the uproar. Fool! Traitor! It was you who told her! His quick, secret footsteps sounded close by, and Schmendrick set himself to turn and fight. But there came a grunt, and a crack, and a scraping noise, and then the bouncing crunch of old bone on old stone. The magician ran on. When they stood before the clock, there was little grace either for doubting or understanding. The men-at-arms were in the hall now, and their clashing steps sent echoes booming back and forth between the walls, while King Haggard hissed and cursed them on. The Lady Amalthea never hesitated. She entered the clock and vanished as the moon passes behind clouds, hidden by them, but not in them, thousands of miles alone. As though she were a dryad, Molly thought madly, and time were her tree. Through the dim, speckled glass, Molly could see the weights and the pendulum and the cankered chimes all swaying and burning as she stared. There was no door beyond through which the Lady Amalthea might have gone. There was only the rusted avenue of the works, leading her, oh, her eyes away into the rain. The weights drifted from side to side like seaweed. King Haggard was shouting, Stop them! Smash the clock! Molly started to turn her head, meaning to tell Smendrick that she thought she knew what the skull had meant, but the magician had disappeared, and so had the great hall of King Haggard. The clock was gone, too, and she was standing beside the Lady Amalthea in a cold place. The king's voice came to her from very far away, not so much heard as remembered. She went on turning her head and found herself looking into the face of Prince Lear. Behind him there fell a bright mist, shivering like the sides of a fish and bearing no resemblance at all to corroded clockwork. Schmendrick was nowhere to be seen. Prince Lear bent his head gravely to Molly, but it was to the Lady Amalthea that he spoke first. "'And you would have gone without me?' he said. "'You haven't been listening at all.' She answered him then, when she had not spoken to Molly or the magician. In a low, clear voice she said, "'I would have come back. I do not know why I am here or who I am. "'But I would have come back.' "'No,' said the prince. "'You would never have come back.' "'Before he could say anything more, "'Molly broke in, much to her own surprise, "'crying, "'Never mind all that! Where's Schmendrick?' 
The two strangers looked at her in courteous wonder that anyone else in the world should be able to speak, and she felt herself shake once from head to heels. "'Where is he?' she demanded. "'I'll go back myself if you won't!' And she turned around again. He came out of the mist, walking with his head down as though he were leaning against a strong wind. He was holding a hand to his temple, and when he took it away, the blood came softly down. "'It's all right,' he said when he saw that the blood was falling on Molly Grew's hands. "'It's all right. It's not deep. I couldn't get through until it happened.' He bowed shakily to Prince Lear. "'I thought it was you who went by me in the dark,' he said. "'Tell me, how did you pass through the clock so easily? The skull said you didn't know the way.' The prince looked puzzled. "'What way?' he asked. "'What was there to know? I saw where she had gone, and I followed.' Schmendrick's sudden laugh rubbed itself raw against the snaggy walls that came swimming in on them as their eyes grew familiar with this new darkness. "'Of course,' he said. "'Some things have their own time by nature.' He laughed again, shaking his head, and the blood flew. Molly tore a piece out of her dress. "'Those poor old men,' the magician said. "'They didn't want to hurt me, and I wouldn't have hurt them if I could. "'We dodged around and around, apologizing to each other, "'and Haggard was yelling, and I kept bumping into the clock. "'I knew that it wasn't a real clock, but it felt real, and I worried about it. "'Then Haggard came up with his sword and hit me. "'He closed his eyes as Molly bound his head. "'Haggard,' he said, "'I was getting to like him. "'I still do. He looked so fast frightened. The dim, removed voices of the king and his men seemed to be growing louder. "'I don't understand,' Prince Lear said. "'Why was he frightened? My father, what did he—' But just then, from the far side of the clock, they heard a wordless squall of triumph and the beginning of a great crash. The shimmering haze vanished immediately, and black silence caved in on them all. Haggard has destroyed the clock, Schmendrick said presently. Now there's no way back, and no way out but the bull's way. And a slow, thick wind began to wake. 